Without saying a word, we turned around, left the ward, stormed down the staircase as quickly as possible, and left the chateau. Once outside, we ran to its western boundary and worked our way forward towards the Caen Canal. We reached the ridge, and indeed it offered a good view of the houses of Benouville and the Caen Canal Bridge. Again, I sensed shell impacts, and I could see the British running in all directions. In my mind I congratulated our heavy mortar platoon, which was hitting its harassing fire pretty accurately without a spotter, relying on the map alone. Here from this ridge, we would be able to support an attack pretty well. I took a look at my watch. It was shortly before 16 all. We could hear intense battle noise coming from the coast, and airplanes were gliding through the cloudy sky. We set about our return through the park. Back at our company I reported to Bratz. He was visibly depressed. The fact that we were left hanging in the lurch so close to the objective embittered him. Reports coming in from Battalion Command indicated that the Allied landings were in full swing already, heavy fighting ragged at the coast ahead. We, however, had not received any orders, and with the exception of firing our mortars there was nothing that we could do. It slowly dawned on us that in these deciding hours our leadership was almost unable to make decisions. After us getting an overview our infantry, supported by tanks, surely would have been able to break through to the bridges. Dusk was already approaching, and we were still lying in the same positions. When I had just concluded my report, we all suddenly realised that an eerie silence had set in. All the aircraft engine droning, all the muzzle blasts and explosions had vanished in this uncanny quiet, which was right away superseded by a loud swoosh. We looked up. From north and east, hundreds of transport gliders were closing in at low altitude, a staggering sight that left us all speechless for a few seconds. It looked like a huge flock of raptors was plummeting on us. In fact, it was a fleet of over 250 military gliders of the British 6th Airborne Division, flying in the last and deciding reinforcements of the third main wave. Coming from the north over the canal's mouth, they turned in a big arch from east to south, passing right over us to the west and towards Hill 61. At a blow, the firing commenced again. Our two centimetre anti-air carriers, as well as our machine guns, opened fire. We saw our bullets hitting the giant birds, several of them bursting into flames, breaking apart and vanishing from sight behind the trees in a nosedive. We shot until the breaches of our guns and cannons were red hot, but it was futile. There were simply too many. After having witnessed this airborne landing taking place almost without interference, we all were greatly impressed, realising that a counter-attack of our own would come too late. Clearly our enemy was superior in numbers and material available. Bratz and I concluded that we should at least try advancing through the park up to the ridge we had discovered. An attempt to inhibit, or at least delay, British tank reinforcements had to be made. The ridge would offer a good position to do so, as it offered a great view of the road leading to the bridges. Now that night had set in, a push under cover of darkness seemed promising. The increasing number of Allied fighter bombers cruising above our heads would be unable to detect us. For additional protection, I got some Panzer Grenadiers to support us. Taking one of my self-propelled guns, an additional observation squad for the mortars and the grenadiers, I set out for the ridge. We slowly felt our way through the park. At around 21 co, we arrived at the ridge. Night had already set in, and in spite of all the fires raging at the coast and Khan, it was getting darker by the minute. Getting an overview would become increasingly difficult. Suspecting a Tommy behind every bush, we advanced suitably cautious. I ordered a stop crawled forward as far as possible and examined the terrain. In front of us, in the Baynouville houses to the left, everything was quiet. Straight ahead at the bridge there was one mortar hit after another. Staff Sergeant Tanner was making a good job of it. The British paratroopers were probably cussing our mortars. After all, they had been under their fire the whole day. Waving my hand, I ordered the SPG to the front positioning the grenadiers to safeguard both of its flanks. I wanted to prevent any surprise flanking attacks by the paratroopers. 
Maybe some British reconnaissance patrol had already entered the park to scout the chateau. I was sure that they had to recognise the building's value as observation point as well. Well, let the Tommies come if they want. We will give them a hearty welcome, I thought to myself. The minute we had taken this position, Bratz appeared with one of his runners. He had finally received information from battalion command. His report was shattering. Advances by our regiments to the west and east of the Orne a few hours ago had been driven back by the enemy. Our panzer regiment had taken heavy casualties. Our 2nd Battalion had retreated to Herouville, north of Caen, and our 8th Company near Benouville was the only one holding out so far to the front. Our positions in the west had already been circumvented by the British, who moved up to Bierville, and to the right the Caen Canal did not allow for an evasion. Thus, we were in danger of getting encircled. We had to escape this trap. There was no talk of a counter-attack anymore. Bratz ordered us to retreat, with our rallying point being the young forest at the road. From there, we were to march towards Blainville and Herouville near Caen. Contritely, I realised that our time here was to end. As a farewell, however, I wanted to fire a few last shells towards the bridge before we went. All of a sudden, we could hear the distinctive roaring of a tank engine. We all went silent, gazing into the looming darkness ahead. To the left, between the houses near us, something moved. Our position was elevated relative to the park's wall right in front of us, with a road and a row of houses being on the other side. On this road, just around 80 metres ahead, a Sherman tank slowly rolled along the houses. Within an instant our nerves were strung to breaking point. Did they find us? I thought. For a second, everyone was waiting for the tank's gun to fire. The tank, however, came to a halt, the top hatch opened, and the commander popped up. He seemed irresolute. Some shapes poured from a house, obviously French, and ran up to the tank. The British commander climbed down to the civilians, and it looked like he was getting instructed. I ordered to fire, but there was a problem. The distance was so close that we could not lower the barrel far enough. There was no chance of firing up the engines either with all the noise at this close proximity, so we disengaged the gear and, with all our strength, slowly pushed the gun carrier forward. After what seemed like an eternity, we succeeded, and the gunner reported target in sight. I ordered to fire at will. The muzzle blast tore through the air, followed by an enormous explosion ahead. Our shell had scored a direct hit on the Sherman, apparently detonating its ammunition or the fuel tank. A fireball rose up, and the house next to the vehicle collapsed. A flaming inferno emerged in front of us. Thinking of the civilians who had been standing near the tank, I was hoping that they had had a chance to escape. But the roaring fire made it impossible to see anything else. I feared the worst, although I also had to think about the elderly man who had sent the two tanks at Staff Sergeant Tanner in the afternoon. In short order, Heavy counter-fire broke out. From the bridges and the houses to the left, British machine guns frantically fired tracer rounds blindly into the night. Luckily, their aim was not even close to our well-camouflaged position. Probably they were not expecting us to be this close. As the ammunition of the Sherman tank went up in sparkling explosions, we took the opportunity to fire up the engine and slowly retreat towards the back. The SPG led the way with me on top. The grenadiers were covering us on both sides. I sent a runner towards the company to inform them of our arrival, but before he could depart, Bratz approached us. He had heard the explosions and the British gunfire. I briefly reported our kill, and he was very pleased to hear about it. We crossed the dark park without interference, although I expected to meet machine gun and anti-tank fire at every moment. After reaching the rallying point in the forest behind the Chateau Park, we continued our departure. At this time I was told that our unit had suffered the first men killed under tragic circumstances. One of Staff Sergeant Tanner's heavy mortar carriers had its barrel burst just when he was standing right next to it. The explosion had destroyed the vehicle, killed four men, and wounded the petty officers as well as several grenadiers. The wounded had been carried off by an ammunition carrier, Unteroffizier Petty Officer Jelinek, a man from Vienna, 
had taken up command of the mortars. Our breakout movement was scheduled one hour before midnight. My orders were to lead the column with my SPGs. Like a rubber ball, I was bouncing from one gun to the other, relaying the orders and coordinating the separation movements towards the south. All the climbing up and down vehicles as well as running between them left me gasping for air. Thanks to the fires around us illuminating the area, you were at least able to see where you were going. Just when we were done and I wanted to report this, a runner came up to me. Enemy tanks had been spotted in an open area to the west. I hurried to the vehicle safeguarding in that direction, pulled myself up the board wall and shouted, Twelve o'clock, short distance, tank, open fire. The vehicle's gunner, Private Witchek, was in the middle of spreading butter on a slice of bread, looking at me wide-eyed when I popped up the board wall and pointed into the darkness. In an instant he was pinched to his optics, and the gun commander let his men load a shell. I ordered them to wait until the target was in clear sight. The runner had alarmed the rest of the company as well, so all were frozen in place, tensely waiting for what was about to happen. With the pitch-black forest behind us, we were hard to spot. By now we could clearly hear tank tracks grinding toward us, the noise growing louder and harder to bear every second. When we were strung to breaking point, Wisek suddenly reported, Sherman, target acquired. Fire, the gun commander responded aridly. The blast tore through the night, the gun jolted backwards from the recoil, an explosion arose ahead, and a gust of flame burst into the dark sky. A hit, I cheered, amazed at the how close the enemy tank had been to our position. The knocked out and burning tank's silhouette was now clearly visible over the open area ahead. It was just under thirty metres away. I scanned the terrain in front of us. There was no sign of any other enemy tanks. Apparently, we had caught the outermost vehicle of a line formation, with the other members having retreated immediately after the hit. Just to be sure, a few shells were fired, and we raked the open area with machine gun fire, wanting to prevent any accompanying British infantry sneaking up on us. But now it was time to cut and run. The burning wreck was visible from an uncomfortably large distance, and falling prey to the well-coordinated British artillery was to be avoided. Bratz hurried towards me. He gave me a pat on the shoulder and ordered us to march off. All engines were fired up and we commenced our movement southward. One SPG was covered by the other two, one on each side of the road, while it drove fifty metres ahead. In the rear, the rest of the company pressed after our tank hunter platoon. The anti-air platoon secured the retreat as our rear guard. Like a giant caterpillar, we were cautiously crawling through the night. Above our heads a large number of planes zoomed through the darkness, and we were expecting one of them crashing on our position at any time. It was clear to everyone that none of these planes were ours. After a short while, Blainville emerged from the darkness ahead, a small locality consisting of a few houses in a dip next to the Caen Canal. We reached the buildings half an hour before midnight. Our retreat from Benouville had been successful, but we had also lost a man in the process. What had happened? As we counted the men, we realised that a runner of the company command squad was missing. The last time he had been seen on his way to the rearguard, the hitherto dependable man might have been captured by a British reconnaissance squad. From the battle noise we deduced that the British were on our heels. A runner's job was not without danger, I knew that first hand from my own missions in Africa. Before you know, you are out of luck and end up on the wrong side. Bratz decided to continue towards Heroville with the rest of the company under the screen of night. Upon establishing communications with battalion command, Bratz intended on pulling back my platoon, putting us into new positions. He also took our wounded to the back in order to treat them, and I had the opportunity to wish Staff Sergeant Tanner all the best. Looking quite haggard, he still gave me a firm handshake. We departed from Blainville, and I took up the position behind the ridge towards the north, along the road towards Blainville. Here, roughly one kilometre away from the village, you had a good view of the blazing fires raging between us and the coast. Meanwhile, the rest of the company continued their march. 
Between trees and bushes we made ourselves at home on both sides of the road, looking towards the Cairn Canal. I ordered the vehicles to be concealed extensively even in the darkness, expecting Allied fighter bombers preying on us from the first light of dawn. After having arrived here, I was finally able to marshal my thoughts for the first time, taking stock of everything. We had made it through the first day of the landings alive. My disappointment with all our actions so far, however, waiting fervently for a meaningful mission and thus being powerless in the face of the events, was limitless. But just like time and again in the past, my optimism prevailed, dismissing these in my opinion tactical mistakes as tiny negative dots in the big picture of what was happening. Encouraged by our mortar shelling of the British paratroopers and the three tank kills, we were thinking that tomorrow or the day after would see the situation completely reversed. All we had to do was advancing towards the coast with massive force. Battle for Caen, in the early morning hours of June 7, 1944, I was already assembling my non-commissioned officers to give a few short orders. Nobody had slept. Ahead of us, to the north and west, the night had been lit up by the fighting continuing in the landing sectors. Multiple large fires were raging in the directions of Blanville and Benouville. Now at dawn, I was shocked to realise that carrying out the withdrawal movement southwards planned by First Lieutenant Bratz would not be so easy. Me and my platoon were situated in a well-covered position on the back slope of a ridge southward of Blainville. To our rear, an open area reached towards the town of Herouville, roughly one kilometre to the south. A road coming from Blainville crossed the ridge, leading towards Herouville as well as Caen. From our position near Blainville, we had a good view on this road, so having dug in at the back slope proved to be a wise course of action. On the way towards Herouville, however, the road was also completely exposed. How were we to ever reach that town unscathed? Moving southwards during the day would lead to us getting spotted immediately, falling prey to Allied fighter bombers or even long-range naval artillery. During the day, we were trapped. Dawn had already set in, so we had to find a solution quickly. I decided to improve our vehicle's camouflage between the trees and bushes while guarding towards Blainville for the time being. I would look for a way out myself during the day. We prepared for an all-round defence, and I ordered everyone to keep their heads down in order to avoid attention of Allied fighter bombers. Now we were waiting anxiously for the coming day. My judgement had been correct. With broad daylight also came the Allied airplanes. Flying at low altitude, they zoomed over the ridge, looking for valuable targets. It would have been easy to down one of them by concentrating our heavy machine gun fire, but this would have led to our end. All those fighter bombers would have descended upon us like raptors, bombing us and our vehicles into oblivion. We could see the pilots take long turns in their search for worthwhile targets. The Allies had total air supremacy. Time and again we could make out fighter bombers in the distance plunging towards the ground with engines roaring, followed by the boom of their cannons or explosions of detonating air-to-surface missiles. Such targeted airstrikes by American Mustang, Lightning or Thunderbolt, or British Tempest or Typhoon fighter bombers could wreak havoc on any ground formation. As such, we had to wait and hope that the British would not commence their push further south for the time being. I had posted two of my men up on the ridge as forward observers. They reported that right ahead of us, on the southern outskirts of Blainville, the first British had shown themselves. As soon as the opportunity arose, I reconnoitred the surroundings with my two runners. After sighting the terrain, we found a good location. Between the road over the ridge, along the Caen Canal, there was a narrow stretch of woodland. To enter this area, only a stone wall needed to be overcome, apparently the perimeter of a castle garden similar to the one at Benouville. We quickly found a solution. First, we blew a hole in the wall with a panzerfaust. In this small opening, we placed a tank mine. Detonating this mine produced a hole as big as a barn door, through which our vehicles could enter the forested garden. In the garden we could, in the evening or after nightfall, march southwards to the company along the Cayenne Canal, virtually undetected. I was glad to have found an escape route, and now hoped that Bratz's order to withdraw would soon come in. 
After we had established this escape route, I returned to my gun crews and briefed them. They happily acknowledged the possible retreat path we had created. We had only been talking for a short time when we heard the sound of approaching shells. A moment later, they impacted on the ridge directly in front of us, with small mushroom clouds rising from the ground. We quickly went for cover. The bombardment faded out after some time, but after that, shells were striking our area in an almost constant rhythm. Perhaps 105 mm shells, as we competently determined. It became obvious that this bombardment would continue through the night. Just as we had come to expect, the British intended to soften up the ridge with their artillery before daring to attack. They had probably brought forward the necessary artillery pieces, and after some more time a series of tremendously large impacts showed they were also employing naval artillery for their preliminary bombardment. For the next couple hours, the British kept up their artillery fire on the ridge before us, but thankfully there was no large-scale attack from Blainville towards our position. Such an attack would have spelled certain doom for us. It was apparent, however, that the British were further developing their beachhead and bringing up additional forces. It also seemed to us that they were only feeling ahead with recon units for the time being, especially to our left in the direction of Bieville, where we could hear intense combat noise. I had no contact to my side whatsoever, and thus feared becoming surrounded. Finally, one of the company's runners arrived. He let me know that I was to report to battalion command, but not take my unit with me. They were still busy establishing a line of defence in our rear at Eruville, which meant that my anti-tank platoon was, in its current forward position, protecting them from unpleasant surprises. I checked my platoon's fields of fire one more time before assembling my runners and setting off to the rear with a heavy heart. Before leaving, I assured each of my gun crews that I was making sure they were to follow me soon. I could see fear of the unknown in my men's faces, realising their fear gave me feelings of protectiveness and care towards them, which overshadowed my own insecurity. I had already experienced this back in Tunisia. They're just like here. Caring for my men made me forget my own concerns and doubts. We got into our Kubelwagen. Slowly and cautiously, me and my runners went along the route we had laid out for our withdrawal. It still seemed like a good plan. Shortly after crossing the hole in the wall, we arrived at a small chateau situated directly north of Eroville, embedded in a small park with lots of hedges and tall trees. During the ride, Allied fighter aircraft had crossed the sky time and again, and each time we heard the hum of an engine we all looked up, hoping that we would not have to find out that one of the fighter bombers had spotted us. Just like in Africa, I had employed my second runner as dedicated air observer. Here in Normandy, however, the threat was much more palpable than back in the desert. Once in Eruville, I reported to the battalion command post, where Major Zipper was holding an initial briefing. It was here that I would, for the first time, get a detailed idea of our actual situation. I also heard that our 21 Panzer Division was, on this second day of the landings, no longer operating as a cohesive body. Our 2nd Battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 192, had been put on alert at 02 Wound, June 6, 1944, and detached by our regimental commander, Lieutenant Colonel Rauch, falling under the command of Colonel Krug, Infantry Regiment 736, at 02.45 already. From 716 Infantry Division, the battalion had additionally received the remains of 1st Company Anti-Tank Detachment 716, whose company commander had been killed during the first reconnaissance in force near Benouvi, as well as 2nd Battery, Heavy Artillery Detachment 989. Our battalion's orders had been to assemble this Kampfgruppe, battle group, in order to recapture the bridges around Benouville and subsequently advance towards Ranville. As such, Major Zipper had sent us towards Benouville for the initial attack. After that, however, there had been no further movements of the battalion, as I had unfortunately witnessed firsthand. Now I found out why this opportunity had not been seized. Battalion command had not been able to coordinate the advance as Colonel Krug had been encircled in his command post by enemy paratroopers at the very beginning of the invasion. 
His position on Hill 61, codename Hillman, had been one of the first targets of the landing force. Advancing without such coordination was justifiably judged too risky by Major Zipper. In addition, soon afterwards the first British forces had been sighted by the other companies of our battalion in the Bouville area. Eventually the order came for our 2nd Battalion to secure the attack of Battle Group Rauch at the right flank at Lebisse and Herouville. The rest was known to us, our own advance on June 6, beginning at 03 0 towards Benouville, had been the only counter-attack by our battle group, and it still fell short of really hitting the British. Late in the morning of June 6, parts of Assault Gun Detachment 200 were even sent towards us as support. They, however, were caught in an intense air raid at Carr, and once they had escaped the attack, they received new orders and immediately headed back east this time to support Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125 east of the Orne. Furthermore, the Luftwaffe attempted to attack our bridges near Benouville with Junkers Ju-88 bombers. One of their 50 kilo bombs even struck the bridge directly but failed to detonate. So, all in all, we had spent the whole day of the landings waiting while our battalion commander tried desperately to get clear instructions from Colonel Krug or arrive at an overview of the general situation. At 0645 June 7, 1944, Colonel Krug and his men eventually surrendered to the British. He, along with three other officers and 70 men of lower ranks, became prisoners of war. During their capture of Hillman, the British had to suffer a high number of casualties. After that, however, our regiment was all that was standing between them and Carr. In the morning of June 7, there still was no absolutely clear situation report on anyone's desk. All we knew was that the British had already bypassed us west of Benouville, standing in Bierville and, presumably, Blainville. I realised that from now on we would go on nothing but fire runs. There was no overarching coordination of our division's units to be expected. Instead, we would attempt to extinguish one fire after the other in our immediate surroundings until we ran out of water. Of a determined attack by 21 Panzer Division towards the coast, there was not a single word any more. I came to the sobering conclusion. The Allies have gained a foothold in France, and we were unable to prevent it. Our own 2nd Battalion now was in a defensive position northwest of Caen, stretching from Aéroville to the Orne Bank near Colombelle. First Lieutenant Bratz had already occupied his part of this line with our 8th Company. I was now to take my anti-tank platoon out of its backslope position and join the battalion's ranks. At the end of the briefing, there was a surprise for us. Major Zip got handed two small boxes by his adjutant before becoming quite formal, ordering us to stand to attention. Then Bratz and me were awarded the Iron Cross First Class for our actions at Benouville. The Major pulled out award certificates and quickly read out their texts before fixing the medals to our chests. The black cross with silver edges was worn on the left chest, and while Major Zipa put them there, he commended our judicious conduct and leadership of our battle group into Benouville and back out again without suffering any losses. Getting awarded this medal came as a total surprise to me. Neither Bratz nor I had expected such a thing. The next tier of medal was the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, or the German Cross in gold. Such decorations were the last thing on my mind at the time, however. My thoughts were somewhere entirely different. For me and my men, the fighting was far from over. Upon return, I immediately started relaying the new orders to my men. Thus, in the evening hours of June 7, 1944, we commenced our breakout movement towards Herouville, we passed the hole in the wall without any problems, marching on in a spread-out line below the ridge, leaning towards the Caen Canal. Our vehicles were well camouflaged, such that it looked like a row of hedges was moving through the area. Individual vehicles could only be made out when looking closely during their manoeuvres. Our withdrawal from the backslope position came just in time. Shortly before our departure it became apparent that the first British units were indeed reconnoitring the ridge from Blainville. Once we arrived at the outskirts of Herouville, 
Bratz welcomed us with a happy face and briefed us on our new positions. The open road between Blanville and Caen lay parallel to the Caen Canal, only up to the ridge, after which it bent away, gradually leading into Hérouville. At the edge of the latter, it crossed another road leading east from Hérouville at right angles. This road went across the Orne River and Canal over two bridges before entering the village of Colombelles, east of the Orne. These two bridges, along with the ones at Benouville, were the only crossings over the Orne and its canal between Cayenne and the sea. It was these bridges that our Panzer Regiment 22 surprisingly did not use to shift into the area north of Cayenne from the east, whether due to an assumption that they had been destroyed or because of cautiousness, I would never find out. Battalion command expected a British assault over the ridge to commence soon. My anti-tank platoon dug in west of the Cayenne Canal at the northern edge of Heroville, close to the village church and a cemetery. Right of the canal, in the direction of Colombelles, the anti-air platoon had already taken up its positions, with the grenade launchers sitting further back at a factory site. These two units were next to our right-hand neighbour unit, 2nd Battalion, Panzer Grenadier, Regiment 125, which was under the command of Lieutenant Colonel von Luck. 2nd Battalion's positions stretched from the east bank of the Orne over the northern edge of Colombelles up to Couverville. To our left, another company of our own battalion lay westwards near Lebisse, behind which 1st Battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, was positioned. The latter had participated in 21st Panzer Division's drive towards the coast on June 6, until it came to a halt here, along with parts of Panzer Regiment 22. On this line we waited for the coming dawn. We expected the British to attack any moment, but such an assault did not materialise. All they did was relentlessly bombarding the ridge. It seemed as if the British were unsure whether to dare an assault or not. This gave us valuable time to fortify our positions. After dawn, we took a closer look at the terrain ahead of us, mostly the area around the Caen Canal's western bank. The road, which was well paved, stretched from Hérouville towards the ridge in a gentle arc. To its east, a smaller tree-lined road ran north into the Chateau Park, which we had withdrawn through the evening before. Between the bridges in the east, meaning between the Orne and Caen Canal, there was open ground. This area became wider in the north, since the distance between both waterways increased somewhat before they passed Blainville. Most of our attention was directed at the roads ahead, as we expected the British to either open fire once they captured the ridge or advance along the roads with their armour, respectively. Considering that, our positions were chosen prudently. Backslope, a good distance away from the ridge, with the buildings of Hérouville in our rear. There was noticeable activity left on the ridge ahead of Lebisse, as well as to our right around Colombelle. At our left-hand neighbours, 1st Battalion, the enemy attempted to break through with armoured support in the morning hours of June 7th. It was only with the help of Panzer Regiment 22nd and, which had remained there since the failed drive towards the coast, that the British assault could be repulsed. Part of our defensive line was an anti-tank ditch that had been dug right at the edge of Hérouville. To keep our left flank secure, Bratz ordered a few grenadiers to reconnoitre the area along this ditch and towards the ridge in the mid-morning. After a surprisingly short time, however, these grenadiers triumphantly returned, accompanied by a British soldier who they had captured after finding him inside the ditch. As it quickly turned out, he had been part of a British scouting party. Apart from the distinctive saucer-shaped steel helmet, he had only had his rifle with him. His comrades had certainly managed to withdraw in time. All of this indicated the British were already standing on the ridge ahead of our positions. Since the British obviously felt uneasy about the terrain ahead of them, they had resolved to feeling their way forward with such reconnaissance parties. Bratz and me tried to get more information out of our new prisoner, a sergeant. He turned out to be somewhat talkative. Enthusiastically, he told us about the enormous efforts that were undertaken for the landings, and that the Allied air fleet would dominate the skies. He spoke with obvious pride, and I had to admit to myself that he was right with the latter point, considering that I had seen not much of our Luftwaffe to speak of.
He went on further to declare his conviction that this war of ours would be over by Christmas, with us Germans on the losing side. In this regard, I begged to differ. While I had a very different opinion, I was certainly impressed by the confidence with which he had stated his. After the conversation was over, Bratz ordered the captive be brought to the battalion command post. In that moment we received a message that left us shocked. The life of Major Zippe, our battalion commander, had ended a few hours before. Nobody had expected this to happen. During a field briefing with our regiment's commander, Lieutenant Colonel Rauch, the two had observed the area from the top of a small water tower. A naval gun shell had impacted near the tower, with a piece of shrapnel killing Major Zippe. We were dismayed at this news. The Major had always been quite caring towards us, and the men and as such had been very popular with the soldiers. On orders of Lieutenant Colonel Rausch, Captain Ruscher was appointed his successor in the morning of June 8, 1944. Amidst all this sorrow, however, there was also good news. Our Sergeant Major, Master Sergeant Goose, reported with us after an adventurous journey from Chiron to Herouville. He brought something with him that we had longed for just as much as sleep, plenty of rations. After I had visited every single position of my platoon and checked communications to our left and right neighbours, I ordered half the men to rest while the other half would keep on securing the line. I also tried to get some sleep myself, as I had been wide awake for almost 48 hours by that point. Over the course of June 7th, our right-hand neighbour at Colombelle, 2nd Battalion, Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, had attempted an assault on the British paratroopers holding Ranville, who successfully defended their positions and in turn brought forward additional reinforcements. In the northeast, a simultaneous attack by parts of the German 711 and 346 infantry divisions had been somewhat more successful, even taking back the coastal battery at Merville, which had been lost earlier. These German attacks had occupied the British in the sword sector on June 7th, which led to us having a relatively calm day. Army Group B Command now declared the River Orne to be the dividing line between 7th and 15th Army. This meant that Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, our right-hand neighbour, now suddenly belonged to 84th Army Corps and was no longer part of 21st Panzer Division. As such, the confusing developments around command and control continued. From June 8, 1944 onward, the British, to our surprise, shifted their main line of attack. Once it turned out that German counter-attacks on June 6 and 7, which the Allies had expected, did not materialise, while British advances towards Caen from the north had been repulsed, they chose another area to go on the offensive. On June 8th, Field Marshal Montgomery set foot on French soil. Since the British frontal assaults around Lebesay had not yielded any visible results, he resolved to order a concentrated and energetic envelopment manoeuvre by his armour. This attack, christened Operation Perch, was to achieve a breakthrough of British forces. Originally, this operation had been prepared for the area southeast of Caen but attacks by Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125 near Colombelle had defeated that plan. Instead, the British offensive was to commence west of Caen. What followed was a series of fierce and hard-fought battles lasting from June 9th to June 14th, 1944. During that fighting, 21st Panzer Division held the line north of the town. The area ahead of us saw a multitude of raids over the course of these days. Both sides attempted to find weak spots in the other's line. Our vehicles were covered as well as possible and camouflaged against aerial detection. In addition, we concealed the infantry positions to also prevent them being detected from above. The ridge ahead left us under the impression that the British were able to observe us. From their position, it was easy to designate targets for indirect fire. And indeed, the bridges over the Orne and Cayenne Canal to our right became subject to naval bombardment by the British battleship's heavy guns. Allied fighter bombers showed up time and again, dropping bombs on the bridges and the village of Erouville. The British were right to assume that we were using the bridges to shift forces between the east and the west. We would spend almost four weeks here at Erouville. After June 8th and 9 had passed without enemy attacks, 
I decided to lead a reconnaissance party on June 10th. I wanted to take a closer look at the chateau and the park ahead. We had crossed this park during our withdrawal from Blainville, and I knew that it was well suited to cover the approach of a British scouting force. The distance between the ridge and the edge of Eroville was almost 1,000 metres, but the park and its bushes were only half that distance from our positions around the bridge. This was a matter of concern to me, such that I wanted to get some clarity regarding the terrain ahead. I assembled my NCOs and briefed them on my plan. There was not much need to assign men to accompany me, as some of them volunteered without hesitation. In spite of the difficult days, we did have to endure. Everyone wanted to do their part and was eager to actively engage in helping defend against the British. Five of us carefully approached the chateau and its park along the road leading out of Herouville. Trees and bushes next to the road provided cover, and after some time we had come far enough to see the chateau building. I looked through my binoculars. The small chateau appeared to be deserted. No movements. Perhaps its inhabitants, like most civilians in the area, had fled to Cayon or even further south. Covering each other, we slowly came closer to this neat little mansion. As always, my runner, Atenader, was by my side, with the other members of the squad covering the building's front side from the tree line. Suddenly, in the middle of our approach, I froze. The chateau windows were wide open. I could hear muffled voices coming from the upper floor. These were British, no doubt. I could not understand what they were saying, but they sounded extremely agitated. I looked at Atenader, who had also noticed the British, gesturing towards the tree line to inform the other three men of the threat. All of a sudden there was a blood-curdling scream, which at first came from the ground floor and then spread into the upper floor. For a brief moment I felt reminded of the maternity home at Benouville, and thus expected to again run into nurses. But this time there were none. It seemed like the British had gone crazy. Before we knew it, the front door between me and Atanida swung open, we could only watch in amazement as around a dozen soldiers stormed out of the house like wasps out of their nest, and just moments later disappeared in the bushes. Even though we had all yanked up our weapons, not a single shot was fired. I lowered my submachine gun and Atanada his carbine. We looked at each other too puzzled to say anything. My men in the bushes stood up and also lowered their rifles. It would have been easy to hit a few of the British, but the surprising effect of their helplessness as well as our own cool-headedness meant that we kept our fingers away from the trigger. We searched the building and found that they had left nothing behind. After that we withdrew back to Herouville. After our return the tension quickly subsided and with a laughing face we shared the tale of our little adventure. We convinced ourselves that the British had spotted us on our approach and became so afraid that they judged the only way to save themselves to be running out the front door with a panicked scream. Surrendering had apparently not been an option for them. Well, the results spoke for themselves. They had utterly surprised us and managed to escape, which they had perhaps not even expected themselves. This incident was talked about even weeks later. The chateau was a good location for a forward base, but we were too few to be able to hold it. Posting observers there would only end in them getting captured sooner or later, and so we gave up on any plan to occupy it. Thus, we remained in position at the northern edge of Eroville. Here, between the buildings and along a thick stone wall, we were safe from air attacks. The open fields ahead offered a great field of fire. The enemy stuck to their guns. They had realised that the park was not in our possession. Already on the next day, they sent a whole infantry platoon to feel its way forward through the park and along its approaching road. Only in the last moment, when they were already a few hundred yards from our positions, did our men spot them and open fire. I was in the middle of my breakfast when I heard the first characteristic bangs of our carbines. Immediately I gave the alarm and ordered all men to their positions. Bullets whizzed above our heads as the British returned some unaimed fire. We were in the better position, however, and I could see through my binoculars how they hastily retreated into the park. I let our MGs fire controlled bursts into the tree line and the park for a few minutes before giving the order to cease fire. 
I took a few men and went forward to see if there were any casualties. And indeed, we found a young lieutenant who had been struck by one of our MG salvos. His uniform shirt was torn to pieces, with his chest beneath showing multiple gun wounds. He must have died on the spot. I was surprised by how young he looked to be. I took his body out of its twisted pose and lay him on the back. His face had delicately chiselled features. I closed his eyelids. I wondered to myself whether I also looked this young. Perhaps not. The last couple days had made me considerably older. I assembled my men and returned back to our line. The following days were relatively quiet, which gave me some time to look around Eroville. Most houses were completely empty. In the south I could see the town of Calm burning from unending Allied bomber attacks. Only rarely could I see French civilians crouching in their houses' doorways, risking a look at the street outside. I refrained from talking to them. What could I even have said? That, thanks to us, they had to wait a little longer for their long-hoped liberation? I felt compassion for them, and I hoped that as few French as possible had to die in the inferno of Car. On the eastern bank of the Caen Canal, we discovered a small harbour with a station of the German Kriegsmarine. To our surprise, we were greeted there by a female uniformed German auxiliary. Once she saw us approaching, she ran up to us, reported with her name and rank, and asked to hand over the Navy station to us. We soon found out that this German auxiliary was in fact a Russian who had been pressed into service. I was astounded. Apparently this small harbour was the base of operations for the patrol boats that we had seen in the fighting around Benouville on June 6th. The auxiliary, a quite pretty young woman who spoke four languages, introduced herself as the officer on duty, and only after we agreed to take over the station for defence purposes, she stated that she was now no longer responsible for the station. After some brief conversation, we eventually brought her back to the regimental command post. We were quite impressed by this woman's dedication and bewildered by the fact that she had obviously been left behind. She would perhaps have stayed on her post until the British capture of the station and, in the worst case, even attempted to defend it. At least she seemed resolute enough to do it. Another incident that I regard as one of the almost unbelievable experiences of this war. 21st Panzer Division was now regrouping north of Cayenne. As such, our left neighbour, 1st Battalion Panzer Grenadier Regiment 125, was redeployed at Ypron, and our own 2nd Battalion took over the Lebesay area. The companies of Panzer Regiment 22 positioned their Panzer IVs in between. After only a few days, however, 1st Battalion was withdrawn in full and deployed in the area east of the River Orne, where Battlegroup von Luck was under intense pressure by British airborne troops, having lost almost half its men already. Our own 2nd Battalion was now also covering the positions at Epron. By now, our battalion's four companies were holding the entire area northwest of Caen, a line stretching from Hérouville to Epron with a length of almost five kilometres. During daytime, Allied fighter bombers had almost complete supremacy over the skies above, and there were regular bombardments by far-reaching naval guns to harass us. The two bridges over the Cayenne Canal and the Orne were the main target of these air attacks and naval bombardments. Their bombs and shells tore holes in the ground large enough to build a small house in them. The terrain around the bridges increasingly turned into a cratered landscape. My anti-tank platoon was lucky to be somewhat protected by the houses of Hérouville, but between the waterways and Colombelle, where our company command post as well as our anti-air and grenade launcher platoon were located, Casualties mounted up. Eventually, Bratz ordered everyone without exception to dig their own foxhole with a minimum distance between each dugout. In this way, he wanted to minimise losses within the company. Up to that point, I had shared a foxhole with my runner, Ataneda, but now each of us dug his own. My hole was around 200 metres west of the canal bridge, in an orchard next to a distinctive stone wall on the northern edge of the village. There was a small house nearby that I used as my command post. From here, I had a good view of the chateau and its park, the area which required the most of our attention. Atanida also decided to dig his foxhole right next to the thick stone wall. 
From there we could see and hear each other quite well.